Hi, I'm Non Stanford, 2013 World Triathlon Champion and 2022 European Champion, and you're listening to the Physical Performance Show. Non Stanford, welcome to the Physical Performance Show. Thank you very much for having me. It's um, exciting to be here, and as a, a long-standing listener and fan of the show, um, yeah, it's a, it's a privilege to to be here speaking with you. Well, Non, it's uh, timely time to record a featured performer episode with you your long-standing amazing career uh, is soon to have it, the curtain drawn on it with uh, just one competitive race left on your itinerary and that's the final round of the 2022 super league triathlon series in uh in in neom yes i know it's uh, it sounds quite strange actually to be to be sat here and hearing you know hearing those words that it you know is finally my my last race, the last race of my career and feels very surreal. Um, I'm ready for, for, you know, for retirement and to transition and to be on the other side, but equally it's been my whole life for so long. And, um, I think it's going to be a big adjustment period going from, you know, being an athlete performing to, to being on the sidelines and supporting. And on the, on the sidelines supporting piece there, non, uh, it's great to see, your talents and skills and uh, experiences being translated uh, into a, a coaching role uh, there with British Triathlon. I think that's uh, super exciting. And I think having known you for several years, you'll be amazing in a role like that. Oh, well, thank you very much. And um, yeah, hopefully um, I'm really excited to, to be working with British Triathlon. I'm the assistant coach now at the Leeds Triathlon Centre, uh, which is headed up by Rhys Davey. Um, who is who is Vicky Holland's um, husband, but uh, also her coach and coached her to her world title and Olympic medals. So um, yeah, it's exciting to be working alongside Reese. And um, you know, obviously, we have a huge pool of talent here in Leeds, and I feel very privileged that um, I've been entrusted to to work with the with these athletes and hopefully support the future generation of of athletes coming through and. Um, you know, hopefully pass on some knowledge that I've gained through my years of racing, um, you know, at a high level and help them, you know, steer their careers and maybe avoid some of the mistakes that I made. But um, yeah, just sort of give back, I guess, to the sport that I've been so fortunate to benefit from over the years. You said something really interesting then on uh, the mistakes that you've made. Uh, looking back on your career, almost there with uh, the curtain drawn on it. But uh, what mistakes do you feel you've made through your career? Um, you know, I think most athletes will uh, have to put their hands up and say that their careers haven't been flawless. Um, and I think my biggest mistakes have probably been pushing too hard, trying to do too much, um, not listening to my body, um, all, all, all the time and you know asking too much of it really and I think those are definitely sort of the areas where I've struggled the most and sort of finding that fine line between obviously as an elite athlete you have to push your limits and find where your limits are but you know it's really important to to be smart and train smart and, and listen to your body and I've always really struggled to find that line I guess um and I've learnt over the years and sort of definitely got better at it but I've never mastered it that is um, probably my biggest downfall I think it's an ongoing uh, skill that I don't think truly ever gets mastered but it, it's also the definition of high performance sport isn't it walking that that fine line between optimizing performance and flirting with injury risk at times yeah, hundred um, percent. It's the it's the game we play as as athletes and um, in any sport. Um, the art of of high performance is um, balancing um, balancing all those things and keeping yourself healthy and getting to a start line in the best shape possible without being overdone or underdone. And um, yeah, you know. Sport is a science, but it's also an art. And I think it's finding the balance between those two things. And your non-foundation story, uh, you didn't necessarily grow up aspiring to be a triathlete, but uh, can you take us back to your your first start in the sport and how that all played out? 
So I started triathlon um, when I was about 19. I was studying at the University of Birmingham and I'd originally gone to the university because it had a big reputation as a cross country and athletics university and I spent my whole teenage years running and doing athletics cross country um, a bit of road running and and so that's sort of where my aspirations um, were when I was 16 17 and looking at university um, but unfortunately I struggled with injury through my whole sort of first two years at the university and um sort of look to the triathlon team um, as a way of cross training while I couldn't run as much. Um, I'd swam as a youngster with a local swimming club and um, thought that maybe if I could get in the pool with a triathlon team and um, sort of maintain a bit of fitness that way, that would be great. And uh, I guess before I knew it, um, triathlon was actually my sport. But I, don't, I think it took until about 2012 um for me to actually turn around and say yeah I'm a triathlete now because up until that point I think I was a runner who was doing triathlon just to keep fit so 2012 was a turning point and it was such a turning point for triathlon worldwide with the London Olympics uh the crowds at the uh, Olympic triathlon drew obviously the success of uh of British triathlon there with uh with the Brownlee brothers uh and uh can you recall what you were doing for that race? Were you uh, at the park watching live or where were you? Yeah, I was definitely at the park watching live. I watched um, both the women's and the men's race. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, I was training alongside, um, especially Alistair and Johnny in the whole build up to 2012. I was very, very lucky to have been training with them for about a year going into that race. And um, yeah, we were there supporting and the atmosphere was just unreal and I don't think it's anything I've ever experienced since and um I don't think it will ever be experienced again in triathlon maybe um just you know the crowds so deep um and just chanting brownly the whole two hours that they were racing it was just incredible and I get goosebumps now thinking about it and it wasn't even for me you know I was just another spectator in the crowd at that point and it was really special and what it's done for the sport hopefully globally, but especially in the UK, um, is just sort of, I think it's, it's difficult to quantify really. Um, the sport re really took off the participation levels really took off. And in the UK, if anybody hears that you do triathlon, they say, Oh, have you heard of the Brownlee brothers? Or do you know the Brownlee brothers? They are synonymous with triathlon in, in Great Britain. And, um, I think we, and credit them a lot with where the sport is at um right now in our country yeah absolutely it was a uh, as a lifelong triathlon uh participant been around the sport since i was a 10 year old uh in my mind that uh, that 2012 london olympic games race was it was uh it's hard to beat as as the race of uh of the history of the sport a million people plus right watching a triathlon it's just uh, incredible uh and non i mean could you have imagined standing in that crowd you were training in the obviously the development program, uh, the elite program at the time leading up to 2012. But but in 2016, you know, you come so agonizingly close to the Olympic uh, bronze medal with a sprint finish with your country uh, compatriot uh, and flatmate uh, at the time, uh, Vicky Holland. Uh, could you have imagined just four years later that would be where you'd be? Um, definitely not. You know, I had sort of personal sort of dreams I guess but they were definitely just dreams back then and um, I'd not shown sort of any potential of getting to that level um, I was fairly new in triathlon in 2012 I think I'd only been doing it for three maybe at most four years pretty sure my first one was in 2009 so um, I really hadn't made that big step up so within one Olympic cycle to go from you know being someone that World Series race ultimately to um, standing on um, a start line Olympic Games representing Great Britain and, and coming so close to an Olympic medal is, you know, it is something that I'm proud of. I'm still sort of bitterly disappointed that I came so close and didn't deliver. But um, yeah, you know, now that I'm at this point in my career, I guess I can look back and um, appreciate a bit more um, that journey that I went on. Yeah. And uh, I mean, that 20. 16 result obviously cemented you as 
one of the top female uh, triathletes in the world. Uh, and off the back of that, you know, you, you really went on to have some, some wonderful results. If you had to, it's a difficult question because every race success means something different, I guess, at the time. But if you had to sort of pick one result, we theme this show, the highs, lows and learnings, what, what would be the most important to you, non and why, out of all your successes? I always find this question quite difficult because I think the obvious choice is probably London 2013, uh, becoming world champion in front of a home crowd. And it was one of those title races where there's three, there was three of us going for the title and it was going to be decided at the grand final on that day. And it was between myself, Gwen Jorgensen and Annie Haug. And, you know, fortunately, and for a number of reasons, I came out on top that day and was uh, and was crowned world champion. So obviously, that's a very special memory and an achievement that I'll always be proud of. But it comes. There's another race that really stands out for me, and that's Hamburg 2019. Um, where I I won the race um, and it's probably one of the most iconic World Series races to win. So that was really special. But it came off the back of, you know, two really tough years following Rio Olympics. I really struggled um, mentally more than anything. Um, I struggled to process the disappointment of the games and um, that had a really big knock on effect on, on my mental health. And I, I very nearly left the sport in 2018. Um, and moving to Joel Filiol and his training group at the end of that year kind of saved me um, in more ways than one, to be honest with you. And I think standing on top of that podium in 2019 in Hamburg was probably one of the most emotional um, sort of races or ends to a race I've ever had because it just sort of showed me that I still I still had what it, what it took and um, it was kind of coming the result of coming to a really dark period. Races is easy when things are going well, but winning races off the back of hard times is, is really hard. Um, and I think that's probably one of the races I'm most proud of. And it was seven years uh, post your first victory there. Uh, no, sorry, uh, the, the mixed relay championships, you won gold in 2012 in Hamburg, but then you obviously took individual line honours in 2019. So effectively seven years between a gold at Hamburg yeah, it's a long time when you look at it like that. Um, and I, I sometimes can't believe when I think back, you know, it was nine years ago now um, that I became world champion and that just blows my mind. Um, I think if in 2013 um, you'd said, you know, you'd said to me, this is the journey that's going to happen over the next nine years, um, I probably wouldn't have, you know, believed that I'd still be, or well, I guess now I've come to the end, but I'd have still been going, to be honest with you, because when you're that young, um, your 30 seems like a really long way away, but it pass, it passes so quickly. And um, I guess the nature of what we're doing, life moves really quickly and you never have time to stop and take stock. Um, so yeah, the time scale does not seem that long at all to me. Oh uh, gosh. Uh, yeah. I mean, I was in Auckland, New Zealand in 2012 when you became the, uh, the junior world champion, I was racing my age category and, yeah, it's hard to believe that was 10 years ago, but time, it's a fascinating thing. Uh, you mentioned there, Non, when you shifted to the, to Joel Filiol's daily training environment at the end of 2018, sorry, the end of 2018, uh, that in many ways it saved your involvement in the sport. And then you said in many ways, what, what reinvigorated you there? What did you learn? You know, how did, how did it change your view of the sport? And obviously instill belief and confidence to keep going in the sport? I think the confidence thing came from Joel agreeing to take me on and agreeing to coach me. Um, you know, I knew that he had a very select group of athletes and he only took, took on athletes that he believed he could help and um, he believed could be, you know, at the top of the top of the sport. So I guess that gave me confidence in a way, um, knowing that he still still believed me and believed in me and still saw potential. Um, but the biggest thing I think was just changing environments. Um, I'd been in Leeds since 2011 and while there was, you know, there was no problem with, with Leeds, it's a, it's a brilliant setup and a brilliant place to live and train. I personally just needed a change, a change of scenery, a change of environment. 
um, just so that I could move on and get past sort of the demons that I had um, from 2018, uh, sorry, 2016. Um, and it just sort of gave me a fresh start and that's exactly what I needed and obviously a change of routine and, um, you know, they say a change is as good as a holiday sometimes and that's what I needed. I just needed a complete change and um, to sort of reinvent my, myself in a way, I guess, and reestablish myself and um, I loved it. I love traveling and being on the road with the team and it's a brilliant group of people, um, you know, there's some amazing people within that squad both as athletes and as people and I just love my time there and um it just made me fall back in love with the sport I guess and um yeah I owe a lot to Joel and um you know the JFT crew um for those few years that I spent with them and uh you were there with your fiance a few weeks shy of being husband Aaron Royal so I guess that was nice to share those years together as well in that environment yeah, definitely. We were really, really fortunate that Joel agreed to take both of us and we were able to live that sort of exciting um, adventure and, and, and lifestyle together. Um, Aaron, at the back end of 2016, um, moved to, or maybe it was 2017, but he moved to, to Leeds and joined the Leeds Triathlon setup. So we'd been training together um, for a couple of years, but it was nice that we could share that change and, and, and go to Joel together and um i think we sort of both thrived um in in that environment i think aaron was more used to that lifestyle than i was because the nature i think of being an australian triathlete is that you have to spend a lot of time on the road um because you have to come over to europe for the european summer to race uh, and train so he was a bit more used to it than me um and probably uh, helped me sort of get get used to that new lifestyle of being away from home and being away from the leeds environment um, but yeah, it was great fun. And, um, it was, it's been a bit different this year because he stayed with Joel, whereas I've returned to the Leeds, the Leeds setup. So we've had to, to manage a lot of time apart over the last year. So I'll see him at the altar. I think I haven't seen him for weeks. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and obviously Aaron's, you know, forging his path into the long course triathlon world. Uh, were there any, was there any interest for you non to potentially pursue that? Or it's just not something that sits on your radar? No, I've never really been particularly um, interested in going long. Um, I love the dynamics of short course racing and um, the bike packs, you know, the dynamics of, of racing in a bike pack. And it's just never really appealed to me. And Aaron has always, always said I had to try it um, because physiologically it probably suits me so much better. I'm a bit of a diesel engine. Um but the nail in the coffin for that was going to watch him race um, Challenge, or it's not Challenge, Clash Miami. Um, and they race on a speedway in Miami. And it was honestly the dullest race I've ever watched. <laughs> and it was a boiling day and they, none of them looked like they were having fun. And I thought, there's no way I'm doing this. It's boring to watch, let alone race. So that was a nail in the long course coffin. I have huge respect for everybody that does it. And, um, you know, I, I enjoy watching it and following it, but um, no, it's not for me. <laughs> it was, a, it was a, a tough one to get your head around though, Non, uh, riding around in circles on a racetrack, but um, <laughs> no, brilliant. Uh, non, we obviously, as I've mentioned, and you know, we theme at the highs, lows and learnings. We could assume that, uh, which is, you know, you touched on the word disappointment with uh, a summit coming so close to the, the bronze there in, in, uh, in Rio 2016, the Olympic triathlon. We could assume that was your, your most challenging day, but has there been any more challenging days than that in your professional career? Um, yeah, I wish I could say that that was the only challenging um, day that I'd, that I'd ever had. But of course, you know, I think uh, the life of an elite athlete means that you have far more challenging days than, um, you know, good days um, or, you know, days where you're, where you're on top of the world. Um, you, you know, there's been plenty of races that I've got wrong and not done so well. And I think you remember them personally, but other people probably don't. Um, fortunately, a lot of other people remember, only remember sort of uh, the times that you've won or podiumed. Um but, you know, I've had to deal with a lot of injuries over the year. I've had um, some fairly some fairly major injuries. 
Um, I tore my plantar fascia back in 2014 that put me out for the whole season. Um, I had knee surgery at the end of 2019 um, that was pretty much career ending. Um, you know, I was told I might never run again. Um, I know those are pretty tough, challenging times to get through. Um, and sometimes I don't really know how I did it, but I think you just, whenever you're faced with a challenge, you, you do, you know, I think as humans, we adapt and we, we learn and we cope and we find a way to, you know, to get through it and to come out the other end. And unfortunately I did manage to do that on, on all the occasions. So, um, yeah, it's nice to sort of now be ending my career on my terms because I always, I always thought I'd end my career because I got, you know, had another serious injury that I wasn't prepared to, you know, rehab, rehab from and, and fight back from. But, um, yeah, I feel very fortunate now considering, um, you know, how my career has been that, you know, I, I managed to finish this year on, on a high and, and not because I was forced to. Yeah. What a, what a powerful exit with, you've just picked up, the silver medal there at the uh, the 2022 uh, Birmingham Commonwealth Games in the mixed team relay, and then you know becoming European tri champion uh, in Munich there, uh, just a matter of a month or two ago, um, just a week or two from memory after the Com Games, wasn't it? Yeah, it was two weeks later. So um, yeah, it was an it was an exciting couple of weeks, and um, you know definitely one that I'll you know some few weeks that I'll never forget. Uh, I actually going into I think the night before the European Champs, I texted my coach and was like, I don't know how this is going to go because I don't feel like I've trained in two weeks because obviously we well you tapered into to the Commonwealth because that was the ultimately the A race of the year, um, and then big celebrations after. Um, you know, Wales made the podium in the mixed team relay, which was a huge, huge achievement um, for us. We're a very small, small nation. And, um, you know, we managed to topple one of the superpowers of triathlon in Australia. Sorry, Brad. Um, but, you know, for, for us, that was that was really huge. So we definitely celebrated that. And I knew it was going to be my last Commonwealth game. So I made sure I went to... Uh, the closing ceremony, which was just three, four days before the European champ. So yeah, I went into that race with sort of, I guess, lower expectations than I'd have hoped at the start of the year. But I think um, I was still riding on the high of, of the Commonwealth and, and put in a really good block of training before that. So um, that got me through, I think. And it was a great few weeks. And um, yeah, I feel like I feel like that was the, the nicest way to exit, um, really. No pressure now for Neom to keep that winning <laughs> going. <laughs> uh, I definitely am not putting that pressure on Neom at all. <laughs> That's just for fun. <laughs> and non uh, dealing with disappointment, you know, you've, you've mentioned that's been part of your career and everyone's, every uh, elite athlete's career. But, uh, what, it, what would be your top tip to athletes on how to best deal with disappointment? Obviously, it's a big question and it's always contextualised to the situation, but you know, what would be your advice? You've, you've just taken on some coaching reins there, you know, a young athlete's disappointed. What would non-Stanford say to that athlete? Um, I always think you have to focus on what you can do and not what you can't do. Um, I think it's really easy to be sort of consumed by, I can't run. Um, you know, I can't go out and do my run today. Um, and I think you kind of have to let that go and focus on what you're actually able to do at that point. If the, ser if the injury is really serious and you actually can't do much activity at all, then you focus on spending time with friends and family or focusing more energy into your studies. If you're still studying or work or, you know, some other avenue um, where you can sort of focus your energy and not be all consumed by the fact that you're not doing the sport that you ultimately love it and enjoy doing. Um, but you know, if you, if you can exercise, you focus on the rehab that you have to do and, and sort of how that's going to, get you to your end goal of getting back on your feet. And I think it's just taking each day as it comes um, and not looking too far ahead and putting sort of a pressure on when you need to be, be back racing or back training by. Um, and those are kind of, that's kind of what I've learned over the years is to, yeah, take each day as it comes and focus on what you can do and not what you can't. Uh, powerful and wise words. You mentioned, you know, rehabilitating injuries there, non and, you also mentioned several of your uh, more significant injuries across your career. What, have you, what did you learn or what would you reflect on now coming 
to the, the near close on your career around maximizing the team around you, whether that's a medical team or, or any team, the coaching team, like what are the, what, what would be non Stanford's top tips to, you know, to get the most out of the team around you? I think communication. So communicate with your coach primarily um, and if you're fortunate enough to have, you know, a good medical team around with, around you, be honest with them and up front with them and communicate because ultimately all these, those people want the best for you uh, and are there to help you. Um, and I think I'm really fortunate that I've come through a system where athletes, staff and coaches all communicate well together. Um, and the, you know, the, a lot of the times when I've got injured is because I haven't probably shared how I'm actually feeling with my team around me. Um, I think it's natural, especially in endurance sport for athletes to endure, um, for far, far longer than they should, um, with pain or, you know, discomfort. Uh, and I often think by the time an, an athlete gets, gets to a coach or a practitioner and says, I've got this pain, it's probably, you know, a bit further down the line than, than it should be. Um, so I would always encourage people as soon as they start feeling a niggle to, even if you just document it, you know, in training peaks or whatever platform you use. Um, and if it's documented over more than a few days, then that's when you start to think, okay, actually this is serious or, you know, worth looking at. Um, so it's just all about communication and, and being honest with yourself as well. Um, I'm very good at, um, denying or not being honest with myself about how much pain I'm in or, um, how much something's affecting me. So, I think that would have to be, you know, my top tip really. No, that's really, uh, really powerful there, non communicate, be honest, act early. Do you think, um, over your career as you matured in years and also obviously your, your athletic knowledge, uh, and insight matured as well, you became better at not deceiving yourself as much around potential signs and symptoms. I, I often, you know, joke that athletes are great, are great self deceivers. You know, we, we want to bury our head in the sand sometimes and, you know, just push through things. But do you think you got better, more sensitive to that, to act early as you went on versus the, the, the young and inexperienced non-Stanford? Um, yeah, I, did, I definitely think I got better. But what I did get better at was communicating um, or sort of documenting. Um, so while I was maybe still a little bit in denial about things, if I told somebody they could help me sort of rationalize it or contextualize it or say to me, okay, maybe you should back off. So it was using those people around me to make those sort of decisions for me and with me um, so that it wasn't all on me uh, and where I, where I was very good at sort of convincing myself it was fine if I told somebody else and that burden was almost off me. Um, and I think as athletes, we often feel guilty, don't we, if we miss a training session or take a rest day. Um, whereas if somebody else tells you that it's okay and you probably need to do that, um, then it just helps you make you feel better about yourself. So I think I got better at communicating um, and relying on the people around me to, or leaning on the people around me to support me through those, those sort of in injuries and times. Yeah, once again, the collaborative uh, approach uh, to an individual athlete, uh, so important. Non, prior to recording this with you, you had shared that you had some indicators that you felt like perhaps it's time to consider where the end of the professional career would, would lie. What were some of those indicators? What were you feeling, thinking, you know, perceiving? I think it's, it's fascinating to how does an athlete know when it really is time versus potentially selling themselves short of what they're capable of? Yeah, it's a really difficult decision to make, but I think one of the key moments for me was pre pre-season um, sort of coming up to the start of the season and the younger athletes were sort of all working out, you know, how many points they had and if they'd be able to get a world series start this year. And they were really excited about that. Um, and I just, that excited about racing world series anymore and um as much as i you know love it and and and, and i've loved my time there i could see that it meant so much more to them than it did to me um and whereas you know for me getting a world series start was almost a given because my ranking was high enough and you know i've been performing well enough i didn't want it as much as them and i just thought that's probably a sign that 
you know, my time is done. And, you know, if I'm, if I don't want it as much as some of the other athletes, when I stand on that start line, I can try as hard as I want, but your heart isn't all in it. Um, and I think that was probably the real big turning point for me. I'd been thinking, you know, considering sort of that my end of the end of my career would be in the next few years. And, um, I think at the start of the end of the season last year, going into the start of the winter, I was like, Oh yeah, you know, maybe I could keep going to Paris. It's not that far away, but, um yeah over that sort of winter and coming up into the start of of the season I think I really started to realize that my heart just wasn't in it anymore and um as much as I love training and I love triathlon um I just wasn't enjoying the racing like I used to so that was that was the biggest factor really for me um but I also have to consider my my health as well and um I've got arthritis in my knee since I had that surgery um so that's quite hard to manage. And, um, I think when you get, get a bit older, you realize that there is a life after triathlon and after you've been a professional athlete and, you know, I want to be able to be active and, um, still live a relatively normal life after triathlon. And, um, you know, I want to stop before my body's absolutely destroyed. Um, and I need a knee replacement before 40 <laughs> <laughs> basically as well. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you're, uh, knee injury it, it was an unusual one wasn't it your the, the cartilage injury in your knee uh, are you at liberty to share a little bit around you know what what happened with that with your injury yeah so basically the cartilage um there's a section of cartilage that tore away behind my kneecap and it was um, floating around um, within my knee. So I was getting a lot of swelling and discomfort in my knee. And while we can't pinpoint the exact moment that it happened, we think it's because there was a couple of occasions when I'm racing, um, I jumped on my bike and the saddle dropped. So I ended up having to race 20 or 40 K uh, with my saddle slammed. Um, which puts a lot of a lot of load through your knee, especially when you're you know you're obviously riding very hard. So that happened in Hamburg in 2019 and Bermuda in 2019, um, and we think that's probably what you know um, started the process at least. Um, so while you know I'll put my hands up and say a lot of my injuries. Um, were not self-inflicted, but could have been managed better by myself. Um, I think that particular one was just really unfortunate um, and sort of, I guess, a technical or mechanical bike issue that's kind of out of my hands in a, in a way. So um, yeah, it was a bit, bit unlucky really, but led to being one of the, you know, the biggest and most significant injuries of my career. Oh gosh, but you've persevered and, 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 and some amazing results on the other side of that, courtesy of the effort you've put into your rehabilitation and the team, you know, guiding you through it. Non, uh, to put, put listeners in perspective of what, uh, through your peak season uh, times, your weeks and years look like, like on a macro level, what did it look like? And on a micro level, what, what was Non Stanford doing uh, in terms of hours training and breakdown? We've actually been discussing this quite a bit as a coaching team here in Leeds recently, um, sort of working out where, you know, a lot of our top performers have been when they've been performing at their at their best compared to sort of where our development athletes are. So where, you know, we sort of we need to get them to. And so back in 2013, when, um, you know, I guess I was towards the top of, you know, where I've, where I've been, um, you know, I was regularly training um, 30 hours a week. Um, I was running nine times a week, which right now blows my mind because, uh, as I've got older, I haven't been able to maintain that, um, or repeat that, um, swimming five times a week and cycling six times a week, but cycling volume very high. So be cycling 16 to 18 hours a week. Um, so really, really big volumes. And that's kind of traditionally the leads, um, the Leeds way, the Leeds approach was high volume, polarized training. Um, and I think my training has always been based around that, but the highest volumes I've ever hit were sort of back in that 2013 and probably 2015, 2016 period as well. I was back able to repeat that. Um, so yeah, at the, at the highest, those were kind of the volumes that we were looking at. And, you know, I do think they work but it's not necessarily sustainable 
uh, for everybody at those kind of higher levels. I think maybe if I backed it off a, a few hours, um, it would have been a bit more sustainable, but then I might not have got the highs that I got. So it's uh, it's kind of a crystal ball question with regards to that, whether I did it right or not. Um, uh, you never you never know if I'd done it slightly different, whether I'd have achieved what I, what I achieved um, off that programme. Yeah, always easy in hindsight to look back and uh, critique, isn't it? But um, uh, I guess that word sustainability, it's going to look different for every athlete, even in the same daily training environment. It's uh, That's the art and science, isn't it, of optimising human performance? Yeah, definitely. And um, I've learned that a lot over the years, um, training alongside different athletes. Um, you know, I think for me, the, the biggest example of that you can do it other ways is Georgia Taylor-Brown. Uh, you know, I'm sure she wouldn't mind me saying, but she is probably one of the, the smartest and most sensible um, athletes that, you know, I've ever had the privilege to train alongside. And she knows her body better than, than anybody else. And um, she doesn't necessarily do the high volumes. Um, you know, she is doing far less than I was doing at my peak. Now, you know, that she's at her peak. Um, but it's working and it just shows that different athletes respond to, to different things. And um, yeah, I don't think I could have got away with doing what she does and, and had the same sort of success, but um, her physiology is very different and um, yeah, you have to definitely individualize it and um, work to the strengths of, of those athletes. And compared to the 30 hours you were doing at the peak of your volume and some of those uh, career highlights, what what have the last couple of seasons look like in terms of overall training hours and, and distribution? I think the biggest difference is my run volume. Um, I probably run now four or five times a week compared to, you know, nine. Um, I would never double run now, which I was obviously doing back then. Um, I run once a week on the levers system, which is sort of like an anti-gravity it, similar to an alter G, but it's a bit more of a transportable system, a lever system for taking body weight away and reducing the load when you're running. Um, so, yeah, just I think that's the biggest change is having to adapt to not being able to run as much volume. Um, but saying that, I don't think my running's um, been impacted too much. You know, I've still been, a, still been able to run fairly well off that. But I did have the years of mileage behind me. So whether that's sort of almost banked, and I'm still able to call on that. I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, I've still maintained a decent volume of cycling and, and still swam either five or six times a week, depending on what squad I was in. So, um, yeah, I'm probably down to more like a, on average, 24 to 26 hours rather than 30 plus sometimes. So. And those extra four or five hours have uh, allowed yourself and Aaron to plan the wedding? Yes. Yeah. Well, myself to plan the way. <laughs> no, to be fair, to be fair, he's um, he booked the whole honeymoon. So um, I'll give him credit where credit's due. <laughs> well done, Aaron Royal. Fantastic. Non, let's jump into a performance round. So this is a rapid fire series of questions. Uh, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Training session most disliked? A hard VO2 swim. And what might a session like that entail, Non? Um, okay, for example, uh, I don't know, 2100's best pace off 130 cycle. Mm, pain. Training session most loved? Uh, a long tempo run. So 60 minutes, um, starting at, say, 350k pace, uh, and every 20 minutes you get faster, finishing at 330k pace. That's my favorite session. Yeah, nice. Favourite pre-race meal, non across your career? What was it? The night before, I'd always have pizza. Um, and the morning before the race, I used to always just have bread and jam. But more recently, I've switched to rice with banana and honey. <laughs> it's a big change, mixing things up, non. Uh, I know. That's what I had before the Europeans, though. So it works. <laughs> it's got a winning, uh, a winning strike rate, doesn't it? Uh, bedtime, morning time, throughout your uh, many seasons of training, non. Uh, in general terms, what would that look like for you? When I was in Leeds, um, wake up time would be about six because we'd always swim early in the morning, six to six thirty. Uh, when I was with Joel, that was probably more like seven thirty to eight because we started always started training a little bit later, a bit more on European time, um, and always in bed by around ten o'clock. 
who's the athlete that non Stanford most admires and why? Oh, that's a really tough question. Um, that's ever evolving, I think. Um, but ultimately, the person or the athlete that's inspired me the most throughout my career is Dame Kelly Holmes. Very fortunate to be mentored by her growing up. And I think she was the one that instilled that belief in me from a young age that, you know, I could potentially be a professional athlete initially in athletics, but she did support my move into as well uh, on my career. So Dame Kelly Holmes, Non, who's the toughest competitor you've ever raced and why? It's probably going to have to be Vicky Holland, isn't it? <laughs> um, even from, there's a video of us at the age of, I don't know, 15, 16, at the British under 17 or under 20, 1500 meter champ- championships. And she, sprint past, she sprints past me in the final 100 meters there. Um, so uh, it's sort of been the story of my life, Vicky Holland out sprinting me. <laughs> and yet you're flatmates for how many years? Um, we lived together from 2014 to 2017, so quite a long time. <laughs> yeah, it's remarkable. It's one of uh, triathlon's uh, amazing little uh, stories there, I think, but it's a great example of uh, sportsmanship and for world sport in general. Non, uh, has there been a mantra that you've used across your career in racing or training, like some sort of regular self-statement? Um. I always, I've got a, before 2013, that race, um, I sort of wrote this out and it was, um, she believed she could, so she did. Um, and I've now got that in like framed, um, on my wall at home. And, um, I think just sort of believing that you can do it. Um, you know, there's a big thing around psychology of actually believing you can do something before you can actually go out and achieve it. So yeah. That's amazing. She believed she could, so she did. No one best recovery tip. Sleep. <laughs> the, the cheapest and most effective one. Yeah, can't beat it, can you? One word to describe non Stanford's racing style. Ooh. Uh hopefully gutsy. Gutsy. We'll go with that. How would non Stanford describe being in the zone? For me, it's being as relaxed as possible. And when was the last time non you're in the zone? Uh, probably fully uh, at Europeans. It's nice that you're, uh, you, you got to go there one more time. <laughs> in the, in yeah. the Brilliant. And non final question in the performance round. We know that epic sessions alone don't make champions, but from your recollection, can you recall the hardest session you've ever done across your many years of training? Um, I've obviously done many hard sessions, um, but one of the ones that really stands out for me is um, it was probably in around 2013 when um, Gwen was starting to, and Annie actually, uh, Gwen was really starting to emerge as, you know, the, the person to beat. And also Annie Howe had this incredible sort of turn of speed in a race. So we did this session that was five by a K and you had to do 400 float, 400 hard, 200 float. Um, and they were all... It blows my mind actually thinking about it. They were all between 255 and three minute Ks. Um, so I think we'd go through off the top of my head, go through the first 400 in like 72, 73, drop down to about a 65 and then drop, you know, back up to that 72 kind of pace. I'm not sure if that's 100% right working out the, the numbers, but yeah, it was pretty, you know, pretty tough session. And um, that was trying to prepare myself to counter the kick of um, those two brilliant runners. Yeah, gosh. Uh, big day, a uh, big day at the office, Non. Non, you're out of the performance round. Every guest of the show, Non, gets issued two set questions. And the first is this. If you could issue one piece of advice to help listeners of the show perform at their physical best, what would that single piece of advice be, Non? I think for me, reflecting on my career, I think it would have to be, if in doubt, leave it out. So if you've got a bit of a niggle, um or you're super tired um and you're not sure whether you should go out and do a session or uh go for that easy run or long ride don't do it um it's better to take that rest day and and be sure that you're okay to to go again tomorrow tomorrow rather than take taking the risk and, and pushing on and probably causing yourself more damage and such a portable easy to remember maxim isn't it if in doubt leave it out non every guest of the show issues listeners with a physical challenge for the week so you can be really nice or really nasty here. What is non-Stanford's physical challenge going to be? 
Um, my physical challenge is to do 10 minutes of strength work and mobility work a day. I think a lot of people's problems are that they're just a little bit weak or a little bit immobile. Um, and um, that's what causes a lot of niggles. So I would say do 20 single calf raises, 20 ab exercises, 20 glute exercises, and five minutes of stretching every day. And hopefully that'll stave off, I think, a lot of people's uh, little niggles and problems that arise. I'm glad you mentioned calf raises, Non. Uh, on the strength and conditioning side of things, uh, how big of a role did that play in your throughout your career? Yeah, huge. Um, you know, I've regularly done two uh, strength and conditioning sessions a week. Um, it's something that's sort of really bought into uh, in British triathlon. Um, every athlete is in the gym at least twice a week with an SSE coach following, you know, um, a structured program. Um, but from a young age, I was actually brought up through gymnastics and strength and conditioning is such an important part of what they do. So from a very young age, it's sort of been drilled into me how important it is to, to keep your body strong um, if you want it to perform um, at a high level and function at a high level. Yeah, gosh, it is so important, isn't it? It's the, uh, the fourth discipline of triathlon. Non, you've been very generous with your time and your experiences and learnings from across your career. So thank you. And it's a big time coming up for you with uh, your final race of your professional career. Me, I'm Super League uh, Triathlon Series. And then obviously the wedding. Uh, where's the wedding taking place with Aaron Royal? Uh, the wedding is going to be in Leeds. Um, we're, we're based here. We live here most of the year. Um, so my mum was a bit disappointed it's not in Wales because I'm originally from Wales. Um, but yeah, sort of neutral ground and hopefully easier for people to get to. Yeah, amazing. And uh, and non, for those that want to follow the journey that aren't yet already, of which I imagine many people are, but where will they be able to find you on Instagram? What will it be? Will it be... Uh, just just non-Stanford. Pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, follow along. <laughs> you won't change post the wedding. No, well, yeah, you're probably going to get more wedding content than triathlon content for the next few weeks, but um, normal service will resume at some point, I'm sure. <laughs> no, absolutely awesome. Non, thank you for your time and your contribution. Thank you very much for having me. It's been, uh, it's been fun. Thank you, Non.